Iowa State football is not the first program you'll think about when it comes to national championships or even good football schools for that matter. For fans who are closer to my age, the one thing that we think about when it comes to Cyclones football was their 2011 win over Oklahoma State that would shake up the BCS world. The Cyclones only won two conference titles in program history, and that was over 100 years ago. The last time before this year that they had finished first in their division was 2004, when they had lost a tiebreaker to Colorado to win the Big 12 North. Since 2000, the Cyclones have only had a winning season eight times, and before the Matt Campbell era, they were a perennial bottom feeder in the Big 12. So how did this program go from one of the Power Five's worst to a team that is now competing for Big 12 titles and has a chance to make the college football playoff in 2021? Well, it starts with their head coach, Matt Campbell. In today's video, we're going to talk about the rise of Iowa State football, how Matt Campbell got to this point, and where the Iowa State program is headed. But first, if you want to support college football on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to the channel and give the video a like, suggest another topic I should do next, and turn on post notifications so you never miss another upload of mine. I've been having hood dreams, ball player, rap star, Billy Ben Tank, BMW, I ain't got no black on the dog face, two twin dogs and make them shake it like a saw shake, ain't make it to the league, but I'm still falling, I was born for this, never thought I'd see the day when I could make it, should I go legit? Let's briefly talk about how Matt Campbell got to this point to begin with, as he started his playing career at Mount Union and would slowly climb up the coaching ladder until he arrived at his first head coaching position with the Toledo Rockets. In 2012, Campbell's Rockets started out 8-1 and, and actually jumped into the top 25 after a win over number 18 Cincinnati. They would go on to finish the season at 9-4 and four, where they lost in the famous Idaho Potato Bowl to, I to number 20 Utah State. In 2013, the team went 7-5, and five, but for some reason they were not invited to a bowl. In 2014, the Rockets went 9-4 and, and actually only lost by 7 points on the road to Iowa State. They ended up playing in the GoDaddy Bowl where they put up 63 points on Arkansas State and Campbell was starting to become a big time name. 2014 was the big year for Campbell and the Rockets as they opened up the season with a win over number 18 Arkansas. He then beat Iowa State in two overtimes and the Rockets got as high as number 19 in the AP poll after a 7-0 start. They ended up losing to Northern Illinois and the magical 2016 Western Michigan Broncos, but they beat number 24 Temple in the Boca Raton Bowl to finish the season strong. Matt Campbell never actually aspired to be a Division I head coach, as his original goal was to be the head man at his alma mater, Mount Union. But his time in Power 5 football was coming. After his wild success at Toledo, Iowa State's athletic director could not wait any longer to hire him, and Matt accepted the job on his birthday. Many people thought he could have gone to Maryland, Virginia Tech, Wisconsin, or even Missouri. And as a diehard Mizzou fan, I have to take a moment for myself, as I honestly had no idea. We decided to hire Barry Odom over Matt Campbell, and I just don't really have words to say for that. And there's just not a lot of words to explain that. When Matt took over, the entire Iowa State fan base was rejuvenated, and he had a lot of work to do. Campbell has often referred to his team as the Island of Misfit Toys, and there are several key players that helped Iowa State football become what it is today. So I've outlined 10 players that have defined the Matt Campbell era and helped get them to this point. I'm going to quickly outline who these kids are and how they got to this point, and try and remember their names. Alan Lazar was a top 100 player coming out of high school and could have gone anywhere in the country. He grew up an Iowa State fan though and chose to commit to play for the Cyclones. Even when Oklahoma and Notre Dame kept bugging him to reconsider, he shut the door on them and became the team's best receiver from the get-go and one of the best in school history. Kyle Kemp was a forgotten player who originally played for Oregon State, but after transferring he was left without a scholarship until Matt Campbell gave him a chance because he recruited him while he was at Toledo. He'd helped them in their miracle 2017 season, and we'll get to him later. David Montgomery was an overlooked recruit from Ohio, and not many Power 5 schools were interested in the kid. He ended up choosing Iowa State, and become the team's main running back and a future NFL player. Brock Purdy was another underrated quarterback coming out of high school, and he was lightly recruited until signing day approached. He ended up choosing the Cyclones over Texas A&M, and he got a chance to shine early on in his Iowa State career, and he's been the feature quarterback of the Matt Campbell era. Joel Lanning was the team's starting quarterback at one point, but Campbell thought he would be better on defense, and he became the leader of the team, and it symbolized the culture that this program had. Marcel Spears wasn't even ranked in the top 1,000 coming out of high school, but he became Campbell's best defensive players and punctuated one of the biggest wins in Cyclone football history. Hakeem Butler was a two-star recruit coming into college, but he became a huge factor in the rise of Cyclone football, and he's now in the NFL. Greg Eisworth was a kid who began his career as a Juco kid, and he is now one of the best safeties in Cyclone history, 
And finally, Brees Hall was the recruit that said that Iowa State football was back. And he is one of the best running backs in college football we've seen in a long time. And his recruitment just signified what direction Iowa State football was headed. But now we got to actually talk about the Matt Campbell Iowa State era. Going into the 2016 season, it was going to be a quarterback battle between Joel Lanning and former Georgia Bulldog Jacob Park. Mike Warren was the running back and Alan Lazard was going into his junior year at this point. The Cyclones began the season 0-3, including a loss to Northern Iowa and Iowa. They beat San Jose State, but then proceeded to lose their next five games, but it was okay. By this time, it was evident that Joel Lanning was not meant to be a quarterback. Jacob Park was okay for now, but they would need to find someone better. They would also see true freshman David Montgomery emerge as the team's best running back. They did end up beating Kansas and Texas Tech before he lost to West Virginia, and this would end their season at 3-9. It wasn't a good year by any means, but Matt got a ton of experience, and he found out where he needed to get better players. Going into 2017, Joel Lanning moved to the defensive side of the ball, and Jacob Park was given the starting quarterback duties. David Montgomery was the running back, and Alan Lazard was now joined by an up-and-coming talent by the name of Keem Butler. With Lanning's move to defense, coupled with the rise of Marcel Spears, the Colons were expected to be better in 2017. John Heacock was an up-and-coming defensive coordinator, and they opened up the season with a win over Northern Iowa. Unfortunately, they lost to Iowa and Texas, and they just were not getting a whole lot out of their quarterback, Jacob Park. It sounds horrible, but when Park got injured, Kyle Kemp took the starting job, and things began to go more smoothly for the team. Their next game was on the road against number 3 Oklahoma, and in Kemp's first career start, he led them down the field, and a late Alan Lazard touchdown ended up winning them the game, and this was probably the biggest win in school history in my opinion. They would beat the number 3 Sooners, and it was arguably the biggest win in school history. They went on to beat Kansas and Texas Tech in their next two games, and they entered the AP poll with a 5-2 record. Their next opponent was number 4 TCU. Led by Kenny Hill, the Horned Frogs were playoff contenders, and this was the biggest game in Ames in a long time. This was personally one of my favorite games from the 2017 season, and in a defensive battle, the Cyclones had a late interception and won 14-7. TCU was plagued by turnovers, and their only touchdown of the game was a Cavante Turpin kickoff return. The game would end when linebacker Marcel Spears picked off Kenny Hill's pass, and Iowa State was officially the darling of the college football season. Sadly, they lost back-to-back -back close games to West Virginia and Oklahoma State, and exited the poll for the remainder of the season. They lost to Kansas State by way of a last second touchdown, and then went on to beat Memphis in the Liberty Bowl. After going 8-5, Matt Campbell was becoming a coaching star, and Iowa State football was becoming more respected. Joel Lanning and Alan Lazard's careers were over, and they were forever appreciated by Iowa State fans for paving the way for future success. Despite the hype, the Cyclones were picked to finish 7th in the Big 12, and that was largely due to the fact that they didn't really have a quarterback. Something worth noting is that Matt hired former Illinois star quarterback Nathan Shieldhouse to become the team's running back coach, and I thought that was pretty cool. Kemp started the game against Iowa, and the offense looked terrible in their 13-3 loss, and Kyle Kemp also got injured. Nolan was the starter for the Oklahoma game and the Akron and TCU games, but they once again were not getting good quarterback play, so they turned to under-recruited true freshman Brock Purdy to start their game on the road against number 25 Oklahoma State. He ended up throwing for four touchdowns, and they won the game. He started their next game against number 6 West Virginia, and what did he do? He led them to another win. It looked like the quarterback change was going to work for a second straight year, and they were now 6-3 and three and sitting at number 23 in the country. To this point, Hakeem Butler had become the go-to wide receiver, David Montgomery was one of the nation's best running backs, and Greg Eisworth and Marcel Spears were the leaders of the defense. Despite a loss to Texas, Iowa State finished the year with an 8-5 and five record and lost to Washington State in the Alamo Bowl. After the season, Hakeem Butler, Kyle Kemp, and David Montgomery were gone from the team, and they would leave as legends. Going into 2019, the Cyclones had a completely different vibe as they were picked to finish third in the Big 12 and were ranked number 23 in the preseason poll, and it landed a pair of Army All-American running backs in Brees Hall and Jirel Brock. But it was not all sunshine and rainbows to start the year, as they'd go into a three-overtime struggle with Northern Iowa in the first week, and they'd fall to the top 25 because of that. For their Week 2 matchup against Iowa, College Game Day decided to make its first appearance in Ames, Iowa, and it was a thriller of a game, but after a weird miscommunication on a punt, Campbell lost to the Hawkeyes for the fourth straight year. They then beat Louisiana Monroe before a close loss on the road to Baylor. People didn't like that loss at first, but no one knew how good Baylor was at the time, so it wasn't a bad loss by the end of the year. Part of the reason Iowa State was struggling was because of a lack of a go-to wide receiver and a consistent running back. Eventually, Deshante Jones would break out to a degree, and Brees Hall became the best back after his 183-yard breakout performance against Texas Tech. They won their next three games and then got back to the rankings at number 23. 
but just like the last two seasons, they lost two straight games to the Oklahoma schools before a huge win over number 19, Texas. They, they re-entered the polls but lost to Kansas State to finish the regular season at 8-4 once again. They ended up getting killed by Notre Dame in the Camping World Bowl and they finished 8-5 for the third straight year. Going into 2020, many expected Iowa State football to potentially take that next step and compete for the Big 12 championship. They had Brock Purdy back for another year, Brees Hall was going to break out at running back, Mike Rose was a great player on the defensive side of the ball, and they had a big time tight end in Charlie Kalar. They began the season ranked number 23 in the country, and I personally thought they were going to finally put it all together, but after week one, there was immediate doubt that would happen. They lost at home to Louisiana. Yes, the Rage and Cajuns were a good team, but this was unacceptable for Iowa State to lose. They bounced back with a close win over TCU before a night game with Oklahoma that was all over national television. Led by Spencer Rattler, the Sooners were coming off a loss to Kansas State, and in a Saturday night thriller, Iowa State would win this game, and this was a big deal. They jumped back into the polls and beat Texas Tech before a big matchup at number 6 Oklahoma State. The Cowboys were a team that were projected to win, and they'd lose this game in a thriller, but this was not the end of the season for them just yet. They rebounded and won their next three games against Kansas, Baylor, and Kansas State, and although that Baylor game was much closer than it needed to be, they could still get to the Big 12 championship game. In what was a really fun matchup, they beat Texas and clinched a spot in the Big 12 title game. After they went over West Virginia, they clinched the best record in the conference and were going to face a surging Oklahoma team that wanted revenge. As all college football fans know, the historic Blue Blood programs of course always win these kind of games, and this once again showed that Iowa State football was just not there yet. They finished the season with three losses after they beat number 25 Oregon in the Fiesta Bowl, and they finished on a high note at least. I really like this 2021 receiving core that includes Xavier Hutchinson and Sean Shaw Jr. And I just think that there's more talent in Iowa State than ever before. They may not be recruiting at the highest level in the world, but Matt Campbell is getting the guys that fit his system and are to his pedigree. Going into 2021, a lot of people see the Cyclones as a team who can make the college football playoff potentially and be that team that can shock and change the college football playoff narrative. Matt Campbell is the best young head coach in college football, and he's been linked to every job in the world and everywhere in the NFL. He'll be a great coach for years, but thankfully he was locked up in a massive extension. So hopefully he will build something in Iowa. So hopefully he will build something in Iowa State, and he'll become one of the top tier programs, and we can see the birth of a new blue blood right before our eyes. Maybe not that. Far. Maybe I wouldn't go that, but I do see a lot of similarities to a Bill Snyder, Kansas State kind of rebuild. I know Iowa State was never as bad as Kansas State was, but the fact that Matt Campbell's established culture has a different style of players and is winning big time games. We'll have to wait and see though. If you're an Iowa State fan, what'd you think of today's video? And if you're just a casual college football fan, do you think Iowa State football will take that next step? And then what do you think of the whole turnaround they had? And let me know another topic I should take a look at next or another program I should do. Before you go, be sure to give the video a like if you want to support my work on YouTube, subscribe if you love college football, and check out all my other videos, including my video about the rise of Brock Purdy. I hope to see you guys again soon, but until next time, peace.